What's up guys, Brad here. In this video, I'll be comparing the SVS PB1000 Pro subwoofer with its bigger brother, the PB2000 Pro, going over my experience with both subwoofers, taking a look at some measurements, and giving you my overall opinion on why you'd maybe wanna go with one over the other. So if you haven't seen my reviews for either the PB2000 Pro or PB1000 Pro, I highly recommend checking those out first if you're interested in either subwoofer, as those videos might answer some questions this video doesn't. Now, as I said in the intro, this will be a comparison video, so I won't be diving too deep into talking about the ins and outs of each subwoofer like I do in those review videos. You'll find links to both in the description below as well as in the cards you'll see pop up above. And full disclosure here, SVS did let me borrow the PB1000 Pro in order to review it and make videos about it, but they didn't pay me anything and this is not a sponsored video. I also don't get to keep the product for free once I'm done with it. The views and opinions you'll see in this video are my own and SVS will be seeing this video for the first time when it goes public to everyone on YouTube. And before we go any further, if you're new to the channel, consider hitting that subscribe button and ringing the bell icon so you never miss out when I upload a new video. Also, I'll have direct links to both subwoofers talked about in this video, along with links to calibration tools I'd recommend checking out and some other goodies as well. These are affiliate links, which do help support the channel at no cost to you when you use them to buy anything. So I, I think a logical place to start with this comparison is with the physical differences between both subwoofers. While both subwoofers use a 12 inch driver, the PB2000 Pro's cabinet is quite a bit larger than the PB1000 Pro's, besting it by about two inches on all sides. Now this larger cabinet size does have a role in giving the PB2000 Pro an edge in overall output at lower frequencies, and it's also partly why the PB2000 Pro is rated to go down a bit lower than the PB1000 Pro, even if only by a single hertz imported mode. Now the driver used in both subs is similar in many ways, including appearance. Going over to SVS's website and comparing the two though, the PB2000 Pro's driver does look more robust than the one used in its smaller counterpart, with more premium features like a dual layer voice coil and an aluminum vented cone not found on the PB1000 Pro. One of the largest differences between the two comes down to power delivery with the PB2000 Pro's sledge amp pumping out 550 watts RMS while the PB1000 Pro puts out the 325 watts RMS. Now, if we're talking power in short bursts, the PB2000 Pro can hit 1500 watts, nearly double the PB1000 Pro's 820 watts. Now, moving on to how they sound when stacked up against each other, I wanna start by saying that the PB1000 Pro is definitely no slouch. And also, to keep in mind that it is an entry-level subwoofer, a really good one, mind you, but it is entry-level. This thing punches well above its weight in terms of sound quality and output, which I think I mentioned almost word for word in my review video for the subwoofer. And that is still my stance on it. Everything I've thrown at the PB1000 Pro has been handled with finesse and it has some pretty decent low end heft and mid bass slam. From the opening to Godzilla King of the Monsters to Ready Player One's race scene in the fantastic sounding pod emergence scene from War of the Worlds, the PB1000 Pro can put a smile on your face and is also a bit easier on the wallet which can make you doubly happy if you're on a budget. It sounds really good and can hit pretty hard when it needs to. But the PB2000 Pro is on a whole other level when put against the PB1000 Pro. Its lower end extension coupled with a significant increase in overall output at those lower frequencies can absolutely be heard and more importantly felt much more so than what the PB1000 Pro can muster. Those same scenes I mentioned earlier had an extra dimension added to them. I could literally feel the bass throughout my body at times where the PB1000 Pro just didn't have the same level of impact or tactile response. The level of slam and impact the PB2000 Pro has over the PB1000 Pro is a bit hard to describe in words, but it's like the PB1000 Pro can hit you in the chest with a baseball, while the PB2000 Pro can hit you with a baseball bat. That might sound painful, but in base and subwoofer terms, i definitely go with the baseball bat if given the choice. Now, to give you an idea of the sound and output differences of each subwoofer, we'll hop into Rumi Q Wizard and look at some measurements. Now, while I would have loved to show you audio demos of each subwoofer so you could hear the differences for yourself, the fact of the matter is when doing test recordings of both, 
the limitations of the microphone I used to record them made each subwoofer sound, well, identical and exactly the same. It didn't represent what I was hearing with my own ears at all, so I made the hard decision to scrap that footage entirely, which means we'll unfortunately just have to rely on measurements. However, it will actually be easier to visually spot the differences between the two in REW. Now, first off, I want to start by looking at compression tests of each subwoofer and comparing them to each other. Now, this will mainly tell us one thing. How far can we push these subwoofers before they start running out of power in the lower frequencies? Now for reference here, I moved each subwoofer to the same spot, disabled Odyssey, and raised my crossovers as high as they'll go, which is 250 hertz. I then level matched both of them as well and kept the measurement mic at the exact same position. There will be some minor variations here and there, and this response will also be unique to my room. If you do this in your room, you will end up with different results. And this is by no means a definitive compression test of each subwoofer, just more for comparison's sake. Okay, so we're here in REW, and just real quick, I have the PB1000 Pro pulled up here. I have my receiver set to minus 20, and I've level matched both the PB1000 and PB2000, so they read the same level at minus 20 on my receiver. So if we look at the two levels here, the red line being the PB1000 Pro, green line being the PB2000 Pro, you can see they're relatively the same level, minus some variations here and there. Like I mentioned earlier, it's just gonna happen. Basically, now we're gonna look at a compression test, and if you've never seen one before, we take a measurement at minus 20, and then we take another measurement at minus 15, another measurement at minus 10, and we keep on going until we hit the compression of the driver. Basically, right now, everything is equally spaced between measurements, as you can see. Got the same amount of space here, same amount of space here, and we really wanna focus on these lower areas, specifically the 20 to 30 hertz area. We don't really need to worry about this stuff up here too much, because we're gonna end up crossing the speakers over. But we wanna focus on this area because that's typically where an amplifier will start running out of power to really provide enough juice to the subwoofer in order to maintain this output at these really low frequencies because these require a lot more power than say, this stuff up here. If we keep going with the PB1000 and we go to minus five, we can already start to see that instead of the equal spacing we have here, we're already starting to get some compression down here. We're starting to lose output because there's just not enough power to drive the woofer to produce this amount of energy. And then if we go down to zero, then we really start to see this compression. So what I did to figure out where this compression point really starts to take over is I did additional measurements. So I did minus nine, minus eight, minus seven, and minus six. And if we kind of zoom in here, we could see that they're all relatively uniform and you know, not one is really worse than the other here. So we know minus five is compressed. Once I did these other measurements here, I kind of realized that around minus six is where our compression really kicks in. Maybe a little sooner, maybe at like minus seven, minus eight. Uh, but minus six and even minus five is still usable in my opinion. But if we wanna get really technical about it, around minus eight is the last point before compression kicks in. That's good to know. So let's move over to the PB2000 Pro and at minus 20, minus 15, minus 10, minus five. And you'll notice we really, you know, start to hit a little compression here at minus five you know, this is a massive boost here, you're able to get pretty uniform output, even with compression, if you want to, uh, at around minus three. That was kind of the last point I measured before compression kicked in. You can choose to use that or you can choose to use minus four. What does this all mean anyway? It just means that when those really loud sections of a movie need that extra power, the PB2000 Pro essentially has more power reserve than the PB1000 Pro. So it will be able to hit those really low frequency frequencies relatively easily compared to the PB1000 Pro, which would just essentially kind of give up around this area. So if we compare the minus three to the minus five from the PB1000 Pro, we can see that obviously the volume difference is there, uh, but we do have a smoother overall output we are losing less down here. What I ended up doing was I did additional measurements of the PB1000 Pro just to see what they would be at minus three, for instance. So if you compare them directly, you could see that around 25, 26 Hertz here, the brown line being the PB2000 Pro, we're still getting 
solid output down to around 20 hertz. Maybe it falls off a little bit, uh, but we're losing output on the PB1000 Pro of about, you know, two decibels or so. If we go even further and look at when both of them are outputting at zero on the receiver, then we could see that there is a pretty massive difference between the two. I'll zoom in here a little bit. The blue line being the PB2000 Pro having much more output over the red line, which is the PB1000 Pro. If we're here, you know, around 24 Hertz, we're at about 100, 101 on the PB1000 Pro. And then we come up to about 103 and a half, 104 decibels here on the PB2000 Pro. That difference between 101 and 104 is about three decibels, which requires double the amplifier power. It's not twice as loud, but it does produce twice as much energy, which is why with the PB2000 Pro, even down in these lower octaves, you'll be able to feel more bass because it's just producing that much more energy than the PB1000 Pro. So now that we've gone over all the compression tests, let's see what it's like integrating a PB1000 Pro into a system with the PB2000 Pro. All right, so I have the PB1000 Pro measurement pulled up here and I've level matched both of these to around 78 dB. As you can see, just like before, there's some minor variations here and there, nothing really to write home about. I have a second PB2000 Pro in my home theater, I actually have two, and I have one in the left corner, which is this single measurement right here. Again, level matched to 77, 78 dB. With both of them turned on, both the PB2000 Pro on the left and the PB1000 Pro on the right, you can see we got some funkiness going on here and what's causing that well essentially they are out of phase or out of sync out of alignment with one another so i just ended up using the mini dsp to get them aligned pretty quickly went through a couple of variations and ended up with a delay of 17 milliseconds on the pb1000 pro now if we turn that off and take a look at this graph here it's not exactly great but uh it is what it is you're mixing two subwoofers one that doesn't have the same extension or low frequency output as the other one. So it kind of makes sense here. Now, if we take a look at two PB2000 Pros together, again, front left corner, front right corner, I just put the PB2000 Pro where the PB1000 Pro was. I didn't have to do anything, and this is the response I got. And honestly, in my room with two PB2000 Pros up front, I don't need to add any delay to either one of them. This is the response I get just by having them both on with phase set to zero, nothing special. That kind of shows you right there, in order to get the PB1000 Pro integrated with a PB2000 Pro, you might have to do a little tweaking. You might need to adjust phase. You might need to adjust delay in a mini DSP if you have that. So it's not a just simple plug it in and you're good to go. So I was also curious to see what having a near field sub was like, trying to get that integrated with both of my PB2000 Pros up front. So I put the PB2000 PB1000 Pro directly behind my main listening position on my couch. And this is the response at that position, level match to 77, 78 dB. Not too great of a response by itself. And then we turn on all three subs together. And you know what? It's actually fixed quite a bit just by adding that third sub. Yeah, we didn't really gain anything down here, but it really smoothed out a lot of this stuff up here that we you know, had these nulls before and really took care of those. So I was like, okay, well, let me see if I can get a slightly better response, a little flatter, maybe try to get rid of these, even though these are a little bit higher at the crossover point. So I added two milliseconds to the PB1000 Pro and then three and then four. And then I was like, okay, we're, we're, we're going too much. I kind of settled on three because it, it got rid of most of these weird funky nulls up here. Two had this really weird dip down here. So if we compare it to just all three subs on at one time, I actually get a bit smoother response. We do lose a little bit of output. If you were to run something like Odyssey, it would just flatten this out to around 75 dB. So after talking about how I think the subwoofers compare sound quality wise in my room, and after looking at the measurements, the PB2000 Pro is a clear winner here, right? Well, it depends on your situation actually. In most rooms, yes, the PB2000 Pro will have more output and be able to dig into the deeper octaves more than the PB1000 Pro. The PB2000 Pro is also a better fit for larger rooms in general, and I'd even bet that a single PB2000 Pro will be able to energize that room more than dual PB1000 Pros because of its ability to generate more energy between 20 and 30 hertz. The PB1000 Pro just doesn't have enough power in the lower octaves in order to produce the same level of energy that the PB1000 Pro could, dual or not. And that's honestly to be expected as it's smaller and two thirds of the cost of the PB2000 Pro. So would I recommend the PB1000 Pro at all then? I 
definitely would. Like I said earlier, it is SVS's entry-level subwoofer, and for its price point, it's absolutely one hell of a great value. If it's your first subwoofer, or if you're in a situation where you either don't want or need that extreme couch vibrating low frequency extension, and have a smaller to mid-size room, then I think it fits that bill perfectly. It may seem like I'm ragging on it in this video, but I'm really not. It just doesn't match the PB2000 Pro in terms of output and low frequency extension, and I don't think SVS ever claimed it would. Now, if you're on the fence about which one you should get and have the budget, I'd personally go with the PB2000 Pro. You won't regret it at all. If you're thinking of getting dual PB1000 Pros over a single PB2000 Pro though, then you have a tougher decision to make. In that case, I would seriously consider getting a single PB2000 Pro now with the intention of adding a second one later down the road if your budget allows. Yes, you'll get more even response going dual PB1000 Pros up front and you'll gain some headroom, but its output at the extreme low frequencies probably still won't match that of a single PB2000 Pro. Once you hear the difference, it's really hard to go back. But in the end, these are just my recommendations and opinions, and it's ultimately up to you to decide what's best for your room and your budget. If you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, feel free to give it a thumbs up as it will help this video reach more people. If you have any questions about either subwoofer or if you have either one of these subwoofers and love them, let me know down in the comment section. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.